So good evening everyone, Noswith Aichi Gid. Um firstly thanks for taking the time out of your busy evening to join us for tonight's webinar. Um, my name is Nia Davis and I am the Research and Development Officer for Hub Key Cymru, Meet Promotion Wales. And I'm delighted to bring to you tonight's webinar, which is titled Grass Check GB, a recap of the 2020 grazing season. So um, tonight we'll be looking back on um, some of the challenges 2020 has brought us, and that's in terms of grazing and grassland management. So um, the Grass Check GB project aims to improve grassland productivity and pasture utilisation with 50 livestock farms across Britain, including nine beef and sheep farms here in Wales. And the project is a collaboration between HCC, QMS, HGB, together with CL, and also um, Rothamsted Research, Agri-Food and Biosciences Institute, and industry sponsors across the UK. So um, joining us tonight, our two speakers, Dr. Debbie McConnell, from, um, from AFBI, Agri-Food and Biosciences Institute, Northern Ireland, and Mr. Alwyn Phillips, um, Grass Check GB Beef and Sheep Farmer in uh, Wales, North Wales. So um, the schedule for tonight, uh, Debbie will be giving a short presentation followed by Alwyn, and um, then there'll be an opportunity to have a question and answer session after both presentations, which will last around 15 minutes and then um, we'll answer them after uh, both presentations so um yeah without further delay um, over to you debbie thanks very much nia and hopefully if i hit the right buttons now i'll be able to uh share um presentation with you guys um so let me know um nia can you see that on the screen now yeah i can yeah brilliant Okay, well, good evening, everybody, and uh, thank you very much to HCC for the invitation to uh, come along virtually and uh, talk to yourselves a little bit about the Grass Check uh, GB project. Um, I've been involved with a couple of colleagues here at AFBI as one of the science partners um, in the research uh, project, um, which started off in 2019. And what I wanted to do tonight, really just briefly, is give you a little bit of an overview of the 2020 data that we've seen to date. Um, and I suppose how uh, the season has panned out in terms of grass growth, weather and grass quality. Um, but I suppose just to start by, by way of background, um, I suppose why are we here and why are we talking about grass? And I think it's always really important to highlight um, actually how valuable a, cro a crop grass is to us here um, across uh, the British Isles. We have a competitive advantage to grow grass compared to much other areas. Of, of Europe, if you look at the, the bottom right hand map there, the dark blue areas are where we have the best grass growing potential across Europe. And certainly um, GB and, and Ireland falls well within those high productive regions. And it takes up about 66% of our, our utilised agricultural land here. So it's our predominant crop. And if we think about what we're feeding our livestock diets, anywhere between about 60% and dairy cow diets are made up of the green stuff compared to up to 95% or even further of uh, sheep's energy demands are met either by growing or in styled grass. So the more we, it's often uh, seen as a crop that sort of just sits there in the background and grows away, but actually it's hugely valuable to our systems here, um, our production systems here in GB. Um, unfortunately, it, when we ask farmers, it, it maybe doesn't rank as highly in, in terms of importance in comparison to other areas like breeding and and young stock management. But for me, it's, it's, it's one thing that certainly deserves a lot of attention. And even if we think about the potential and the opportunities in grass going forward, um, certainly we've got huge opportunity to build sustainability in a ruminant production systems because of grass. grass. If we look at the sort of the figures in the middle of the screen there in terms of the, the production cost of grass compared to other feedstuffs, it still is the cheapest feedstuff that we have available to us. £52 per tonne of dry matter is what it would typically cost us. And when we think about environmental sustainability, our research at AFBI has shown that grassland has a key role to play in sequestering large amounts of carbon and productive grassland is incredibly good at that. We know that the more we can graze animals, we can lower our ammonia footprint. And when we think about things like nutrient budgets, our research here has shown that both in beef and in dairy systems, using more grass and growing an extra ton of grass dry matter per hectare has a significant, uh, significantly positive effect on our phosphorus footprint. 
So we can lower our phosphorus footprint quite significantly if we make more use of grass. So hopefully I've convinced you that it's certainly something that we need to be paying a lot of attention to. And that's really part of the ra rationale behind the Grass Check GV project to say, look, what can we do with grass and where is there potential to really boost what we do with it here in GV? Unfortunately, there is a little bit of room for improvement. Um, the graph on the bottom left hand side here is uh, average grassland performance. And this is on commercial dairy farms and beef and sheep farms in Northern Ireland. But the figures are fairly similar from G for GB as well. And really what that's showing is we're currently utilising about seven and a half tonne of dry matter per hectare uh, on dairy farms in Northern Ireland and only about 4.1 tonne of dry matter per hectare on beef and sheep farms. So there's considerable potential to really lift that because if we look at what grass varieties are growing today in terms of what's coming out of both plot work and um, with our new cultivars, but also some commercial farm data as well, we know that we can start to reach in excess of 14, 15 tonne of dry matter per hectare. So there's huge potential to really lift what we're doing with grass. And actually one of the key things, and it's not the only answer, definitely not, but one of the key things that we've noticed is that recording grassland performance is absolutely key to improving productivity. And the graph in the bottom right shows Northern Ireland dairy farm average in the grey bar. The yellow bar is the annual grass productivity from farms that are recording grass, uh, grass yields, and then the black bar is our grass check dairy farms. And so we know those farms that are involved in high levels of recording of grassland productivity um, are associated with higher yields. Um, we're growing at least two thirds more grass in those farms that are, are, are week in, week out recording grassland productivity. So it's not the only thing, but it is a key element if we want to try and boost our productivity um, from grasslands. So Nia's already highlighted it, but the Grass Check GB is really effectively that, that, that. The project is about measuring grass on commercial farms in Northern Ireland and really trying to understand what our actual and our potential grass growth is across GB. There's 50 farms involved in the project, dairy, beef and sheep. You can see they're fairly widely spread across the whole of, the whole of GB. So we've got a range of different weather and soil types and different farm types involved in the programme. And what we want to do is look at what we can produce in GB, look at what the key drivers are behind better grass growth and utilisation. And we currently do some grass growth forecasting in, in Northern Ireland. And over the lifespan of the project, we want to then fit our forecasting models to GB to effectively provide grass growth forecasts um, for the different regions. So I suppose, um, and just, just to highlight all of the information that we record each week, uh, be that grass growth and grass quality, which comes in from commercial farms, is put up on the Grass Check uh, GB website, which you can see some screenshots of it there. So do um, check it out if you haven't been there already. So what have we seen in 2020? Well, in comparison to 2019, where we had a fantastic grass growing year and everything went as we expected to, 2020 threw a little bit, um, threw the books at us a little bit because um, certainly it was a very difficult start to the year. Having come in through the winter with fairly dry soil conditions and reasonably good growth um, through the winter months, by the time we got to February, we seen very, very wet conditions coming through. And in a number of farms, and quite a few of them in Wales, unfortunately, recording in excess of 250 millimetres of rainfall in February. So it was phenomenally wet. To put that into context, typically on average, we get 89 millimetres of rainfall across the UK in February. So a big lift there in the amount of rainfall that we've seen. That extra water in the soil and in general low conditions meant that we had very low soil temperatures coming through the start of March. And it was really... In, only into sort of the middle of April and you can see it in the graph there on the left hand side for each of the different regions for Wales, Scotland, Northern England and Southern England. Our soil temperatures are really only starting to get um, anywhere meaningful really above six by the time we're sort of getting into the second, um, uh, second and third week of April and it's not really into sort of, um, sort of the second half of April where we really start to see the lift. You can see the differences across the region with Scotland continually having uh, lower soil, uh, soil temperatures um, as you would expect with it being a little bit further north. So we went from very wet, very cold conditions at the start of the year into exceedingly dry conditions in 
April and May. So you can see there the graph on the bottom right hand side is total rainfall across the month. And in April, all of the regions on average recorded less than 20 millimetres of rainfall throughout that month. Um, and it, in actual fact, between March and June, we only had about just over half of what we would expect to get in the three months of the year. So that meant we went from very wet to very cold conditions, which hindered growth early on, to then very dry conditions. And this graph here is a graph of soil moisture that we've recorded on the weather stations on the Grass Check GB farms. And again, I've split this into the regions, Wales, Scotland, Northern and Southern England. And the graph here um, is a measure of soil moisture, or actually it's better to think of it as soil dryness because the higher the value here, actually the drier the soil. So what we can see is at the start of the start of the year, we had very wet conditions um, in, in the start of the grazing season. So we had figures sort of less than 20, and that would sort of indicate waterlogged soils. But as we got through um, from May and into um, uh, the start of June, we started to get into exceedingly dry conditions. And the value of 60, if you can see it there on the graph, is typically above that value, we would start to expect grass growth to be restricted. Once we reach values of 120, our data from last year would suggest that's when our growth rates will at least be halved. And by the time we get to values of 140, we're growing less than 10 kilograms of grass dry matter per hectare per day. So that, that, that's really when we're in really um, drought conditions with very low growth. And what we've seen was for all of the regions, but particularly Wales, North and South England, we had about an eight week period where um, soil moisture levels exceeded that threshold of about 60 centibars. So we were in very dry conditions and it lasted for a long period of time. Now, southern England did continue to stay quite dry, actually, um, through the summer months um, before finally sort of wetting up back again at the start of September. Um, but we see very dry conditions. And the big challenge with that is that dry period compared to 2018 actually hit us when we would expect peak growth to hit, which is sort of middle of May, start of June, that tends to be our bulk, bulk months for grass growth. So all of that had a fairly big impact on um, our, the total amount of grass that we were producing across farms and um, across GB. So this is our grass growth curve. So the blue line is our 2019 average farm grass growth. And the yellow line is our beef and sheep farm average from across GB. And so far to date, we've produced 7.2 of dry matter per hectare um, and we're down roughly about 16% on where we'd expect to be at this time of the year and you can see that's predominantly coming from both the very late starts of the season so we had poor grass growth uh, early on in the season and then that held th those low grass growth levels held through into uh, May and June so we're missing out on the big and the big peak bulk of grass growth that we typically expect at that time of year. In comparison, dairy doing a little bit better, um, uh, but again, still down about 9% on where we would be at this time last year. So, so far to date, um, they've grown 9.9 .9 tonnes of dry matter per hectare. That said, even though we've had a difficult year, when you look at the yields that we're growing, 7.2 and 9.9, .9, you compare that to what, we, what we're seeing, the average commercial farm grow um, is Ireland and GB and our grass growth yields are still well above that. So even in a difficult year, we can still achieve good yields of grass. Just to take a little bit closer look at the regional averages and in particular Wales, um, all regions um, unfortunately were affected by that extreme weather conditions during spring and early summer. And so we're seeing grass production down anywhere between 6 to 27% compared to 2019. Now, actually, Scotland, even though it didn't have as dry conditions, it got hit really badly with low temperatures early on. And that was uh, that was uh, felt much longer there than it was in any of the other regions. So though they're down um, in terms of grass production, it's for a slightly different uh, reason. But Wales itself has actually fared the best of all the regions, only been down about 6% in terms of grass growth compared to 2019. So on average here in Wales, we're growing 10 tonne of dry matter per hectare, just back about 700 kilos on this time last year. 
Um, we had a big loss in sort of that spring, early summer growth, as you can see um, from the graph there, missing out on peak production. But what we've seen phenomenally come through in Wales very clearly was um, uh, sort of once we got into July and August, very good recovery during the summer months. And that's helped close the gap a little bit in terms of total grass production. So roughly on average, we're seeing sort of 70 kilos of grass dry matter per hectare per day through July and August, which is phenomenally good growth for that time of the year and much above what we would expect. Um, but the one thing I wanted to highlight just on the on grass growth measurements is that, um, and why it's so important to keep measuring, is that there was huge variability because once we've seen these dry conditions, and yes, we have shown you the averages across the regions, certainly what we did notice as well is huge amounts of variability between individual farms. And that's coming for a number of reasons. Um, some farms, obviously, drier soils uh, or wetter soils, um, different uh, areas, of uh, microclimate areas that you tend to see um, occur in the countryside. Um, and then different um, uh, different levels of nitrogen fertilization and that sort of thing as well. So we do see quite a lot of variability. And this is just a week from the 8th of June uh, this year. And we can see that if we look across the beef and sheep farms, measuring grass growth across GB, there's quite a significant variation there in the daily grass growth rate, um, ranging from about 10, 15 down at the bottom up to 70 and an excess of 100 kilograms of dry matter per hectare per day on the, on the, on the um, farm with the highest growth that week. So a lot of variability there. And I suppose that really just highlights, again, why it's important to be measuring grass, because it does allow us to identify that variability in terms of grass growth throughout the season make sure that it helps us manage our grass supply and our grass covers and, and, and to manage that a little bit better. It also helps uh, identify variability in the product performance at the end of the year, prioritise the resources such as limes and reseeding, and also shows us what we're capable of doing. So huge value there. Just to finish off in terms of grass quality, what we've seen this year is that despite weather conditions um, certainly uh, being challenging, good quality values in general have remained um, throughout the season. We've had an average dry matter content of 21%, crude protein of 19.6%, and ME of 11.7 uh, megajoules per kilogram dry matter. And you can see that, yes, there has been a little bit of variability throughout the season. But overall, in general, we've had fairly good quality conditions um, remaining. So testament, I think, to good management because quite often we see that where these, um, where I mean, where grass wards are well managed, um, we know that we can maintain quality right the way throughout the season. So testament to the farmers involved in the project for doing that. So really, just to finish off for me, I think the, the take home things from 2020 um, so far is that it's been a challenging year for many reasons. Um, but in terms of uh, grass growth on uh, commercial farms, our GB farms have again shown that we have got the capacity to grow high volumes of high quality pastures throughout the year. Um, but there is quite large variation in growth rates between the different areas and different seasons. So either looking um, regularly at what growth rates are in, a, in an area close to you and better yet, even uh, measuring on farm is really important. Um, we didn't really get to touch on that much tonight, um, but certainly as we look forward and the impacts of climate change is, are, are going to be great for us here um, in, uh, in GB. And that's going to bring increased volatility in grass growth. I mean, the last couple of years has already shown us how variable our seasons can be. So measurement will be increasingly important. We've also got to then, now is a good time to take stock and look ahead to our grazing season next year. Have we got adequate infrastructure? Have we got resilient soils? And have we got durable swords that are going to give us maximum flexibility to really make the most of the grass that we have available to us? So that's all I really wanted to, to say um, tonight, uh, Nia. Um, uh, happy to take any questions at the end, but for the moment, I'll pass back over to you. That's great. Thank you, Debbie. Uh, it's great to see so many figures and um, graphs and graphs behind the 2020 season. It really brings to light the challenges that have been. Um, so yeah, we'll move over to Alwyn then, um, and then we'll have questions and answers. Please do write your um, questions in the chat box. Um, So, 
Yeah, over to you, Alwyn. Thank you. Good evening, all. Um, next slide, please. Yeah. In 1999, I went to <coughs> New Zealand on the sheep property scholarship to look at the sheep industry and how they found out subsidies. And there, because they were the leading country in sheep production and also the first country to successfully farm without subsidies. But halfway through, well, two years in, I got this statement in front of me. There is no room for the consistency of New Zealand agriculture for 20%. I was shocked to hear this, but by the end of my discussion, I began to understand what it meant. New Zealand's success for it down to three words. Graphs, genetics, and innovation. Graphs and time focus on improving the graph protection to get the board sheep from the board across and innovation to embrace the economic thing. Well, we have two parts of sheep. Two of 30 fold offset lambing in one of two steps. And we also have the textbook running in March, and the both performance recorded. We might have deserved the since 1980, and have a close crop policy since 1998. We use an in software to sort out our token groups, and we use AI to do the new bloodlines every three or four years. And I always use program style, I never use any ones. We sell about 60 shillings off the farm. We do not wash or brush or trim or bloom dip our rams. Don't push consistently to make the rams look bigger. This only changes the appearance of the ram. It does not change the actual genetic potential. And we also have a small herd of livers and cattle. So. Yeah. 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 Hello. Next. Fodder bit. We grow about two hectares of fodder bit, enough to keep off feed for 100 years for about 100 days. The roots, about 60, 80 tons, which contain 6% protein. And has an ME of 13.2 megajoules per kilo of dry matter. The leaf field about 20, 10, 20 tons and contains about 15, 20 percent protein and an ME of 10.5. We strip graze the fodder with electric fence, which works very well. We allocate about a square meter per day per you, and I work out the other needed per day and set up the fencing. We alternate the grazing for two days, followed by another three days, and then back to two days. The first thing the sheep eat when entering is all the tops where the protein is. For the sheep's stomach to function properly, it needs a balance between the ME and the protein. And by strip grazing, we can control this balance and their intake. By having a protein ME balance, they also graze the roots far better. Next. Yeah. Herbal lace. We, that's it. We've reseeded the beef for the cells with herbal lace this year. And I'm told the herbal lace do perform better in a cell grazing system. Managing the herbal lace would be a new challenge for me as herbals do not last that, that long due to overgrazing. But the benefits are the chicory, plantain, and red clover have deeper roots that improves the structure, soil structure, and gives rough roots access to moisture during the drought period. And also the roots go deeper to increase the availability of trace elements. Herbal lays also have anthelmintic properties and have a high protein of 18-20% crop content. Herbal lays also offer lambs 
more variety of herbs and grass species to eat. And hopefully we'll be able to increase lamb growth, which is after all, the lamb will tell us what the final proof is. Just that. We have this is the photo of our herbal day. And our breeding objections, objectives has been to performance, record lamb's ability to convert grass to meat and to supply prime lambs to prime lamb producers so that their lambs do perform off grass, our cheapest source of food. And then those lambs in the natural grass do live longer and are fitter and are more fertile, capable of serving ATUs. Next. Performance recording. Performance recording, whatever breed you are keeping, performance recording will identify the poor, the average, and the top percent animals in your flock. We pregnancy scan our sheep, tag and weigh all our lambs at birth, and record easel lambing. We weigh at eight weeks and at 20, 18, 20 weeks. We also scan for back fat and eye muscle depth. And after blood prime, we select the best 20 ram lambs of the five from each of our stock rams. And these 20 go forth for CT scanning. And using this information, we select the top two stock rounds each year. The CT, the CT images give us accurate measurements. You see that on the left is your see, lamb going through the CT. On the right are the images of individual lambs. The CT images give us a total fat, muscle, bone, and killing out percentage. The jiggered shape, the eye muscle area, which is a chop, spine length, and intramuscle fat. And the latest HCC tasting panel showed the importance of intramuscle fat, producing juicer meats which the consumer wants. There are many more if, if data coming from those images than I can put down tonight, but uh, we find them the very, very, very good information to work with, 99% accurate. The RAM compare. There were 211 rams of eight different breeds produced 19,000 lambs. These rams are placed on nine commercial farms across the UK and record under farm conditions. 19,000 lambs are recorded from birth to slaughter. In 2018, the ram came first overall carcass merit. Another came second in 2019. And 2020, two of my top rams in the top 10 one of them had the highest <coughs> EBV days for slaughter, and his lambs reached the market three weeks earlier than any other Texel ram in the ram project. Yes, sir. We've been part of the IBUS Proso project since 2010. We, our project has been aeration. And um, without a healthy soil, you cannot exploit the full grass potential. The field is divided into four. Two parts are rated and two are left alone. We record monthly earthworm count, root depth, record soil, air temperature, and rainfall, and cut and weigh grass from cages and send for analysis and test for water infiltration and compaction. The two things I've learned most about the soils from this project is that there are more livestock underground working 24-7, improving the soil structure that's above the ground. And healthy soil produce healthy grass, healthy animals, healthy food to the consumer and reduces antibiotics. Now, grass. Welsh farms are predominantly a grass-based system. On average, Welsh farms grow about 8 tonnes kilograms of dry matter per hectare. The potential is to grow 15 plus tonnes per kilograms per dry matter per hectare. We have in Wales a climate to grow grass equal, if not more, than New Zealand. And grass has a key role to play in carbon footprint. 
and Wales in a good position to earn some income from carbon credits. High covers does not always mean high quality grass. Lambs prefer the young short grass and cattle prefer the long grass due to the way they graze it. And grass is still the cheapest food, cost of food, that's five pence per kilo dry matter, compared to compound feed cost 25 to 30 pence per kilo dry matter. And looks like this year that's going to go up with the prices of grain. Having grown the grass, we must make better utilization of it. I know farmers in New Zealand who consistently have lambs that gain in 400 to 500 grams a day on grass, grass only. As we have no control on prices, but we do have control on our grass production, and that's where we grass comes a major part. So, Techno Grazing. I met Harry Weir, owner of Techno Grazing, that's an open day in Jerry Rowley's Low London Station in Middlemarch, New Zealand. I was extremely impressed with the quality and quantity of grass grown at the Logan Burn Station, the simplicity of the cell system. And in 19, 2015, I contacted Harry Weir and in 2016 converted Pengahi to Techno Grazing. What I like about Techno Grazing is we, they're all made into hectare paddocks, 250 ewes and lambs grazed for one day. If you want 500, you put two, two hectare paddocks. The sheep enter at 2,200 kilograms dry matter, and important that they leave at 1,500 kilograms dry matter. This keeps a, a one leaf on the plants that stimulate rapid regrowth, and it also gives the grass enough time to recover. The, also, I think uh, leaving high covers reduces the worm eaten at the base of the of the plant stem and the real advantage I find is that you see all the stock when moving every day and good water supply is very essential during the drought period which we had all experienced this year. I now grow 35% more grass, I've increased my stock numbers, I've seen a good improvement in my old pasture, in set stocking sheep farmer Sheep hammer the good grasses, allowing the poor species to become dominant and tough. In a cell grazing system, all grasses are young and are eaten evenly, and our reduced fertilizer bill has helped as well. The challenge I feel I get is to try to run two flocks at different lambing times. And it's at times, especially during this year, has been quite a, a tough one. Grass Check GB, there are two in 2019, 23 dairy and 28 beef sheep farmers across UK took part. We measure all the cells weekly and download the information onto Agrinet software. It's important that you take the measurements in the same route every week to give you a more consistent growth pattern. And every week we receive a report and every fortnight I send grass samples for analysis from different cells each time. I now find <coughs> the time spent measuring grass is the most valuable and productive couple of hours a week. You learn so much about the capabilities of your farm. And like everything else for recording, you need the discipline to do it properly, otherwise it's fairly pointless. This is a photo of my weather station on the farm. And uh, this is working 24 hours a day, measuring the, uh, the speed, the wind speed, the rainfall, the sunshine hours, soil moisture, air and soil temperature. And that information is valuable for us when we're growing grass to, especially for predicting the future growth. Yeah. I put this wedge in, this slide in for you to see. On the left, you've got a May the 23rd, and that blue line is my demand line. And on September the 12th, the same paddocks, and the my demand line is, and my excess is totally different. In a normal season, you expect 
the September growth to be in May and maybe the May growth in September. But this just demonstrates how much the drought affected our grass production this year. Yeah. Lessons I've learned from grass check GB. It demonstrates we can grow more quasi grass. Growing more grass, you need more stock numbers to utilize it. But it also means more kilos of meat per hectare, which is more profit. Agrinet's report tells me how much grass I have on the farm. I know my stock demand for a week and can we plan ahead. This also gives me early warning if we have a surplus and identify which cells to take out for silage. This silage is exceptionally quality and does not need to concentrate. But it also at the same time gives an early warning of the impending drought and the need to start supplementing feeding with silage, concentrate or both to allow the grass to catch up. But another option is to sell lambs or stores and maybe when grass comes back, buy some more back in. But it just gives you that edge of um, in anticipating what's ahead of you. The other thing is <coughs> use the plate meter. Um, it's an excellent tool that gives me the kilograms dry matter per hectare per, per hectare. But the question that keeps recurring to me in my mind is fields with high weed of weeds like docks, thistles and nettles. How do I count for this when measuring grass value? And as I said, tra travel across the country, I see very good fields growing weeds where that space should be growing valuable grass. I'm, I'm getting a bit, every time I travel now, I'm looking at the grass and I'm looking at the sheep. Preparing for 2001. This year, <coughs> I will close my cells much earlier this year because of the drought. I would grace out and start shutting cells in late October, 20%, 40% in November, 60% in December, 80% in January. This will give us higher grass cover in spring and will kickstart the grass growth with daylight lengthening and photosynthesis increasing. Summary. We must weigh a measure to know if we're making progress. From the day the lamb is born, it is costing us money. So the sooner it reaches the 40, 45 kilo, we increase our profits and it just shows how important it is to get good grass to get that growth rate. Farmers buy in appearance is subjective and those farmers who buy in performance is subjective. Only 55% of UK lambs hit the trackers classification. We also have the world's largest pool of genetics. We have 55 breeds compared to New Zealand 10 breeds. We can grow grass equal or more to any country in the world. And Grass Check GB gives me performance recorded grass to complement my performance recorded lands. We know that the edit payments will continue to 2021 and after that there will be changes. And we need desperately to know what these changes are because it takes at least five years to, make it, to implement these changes but we have the tools to make the changes, but some things never change. Sheep and cattle eat grass, pigs and poultry eat concentrate, and Welsh lamb's reputation has been achieved in the back of Welsh grass. Yeah, well, it's rushed, but yeah. Thank you very much, Alwyn. That was great. Um, so there is a there are a few questions. Um, so um, first question um, in terms of seasons change, um, perhaps a question for Debbie. Um, would Grass Check GB consider assessing the growth during winter months at all? Yeah, I think um, very much so. So. Typically, when we've recorded growth during the winter and our, our and measurements that we've taken here in Northern Ireland, our growth has typically been very low. So we're talking maybe in the region. Some years we see sort of uh, two kilograms of growth per hectare per day. Other 
years we're seeing upwards of eight and nine kilograms of growth per hectare per day. But very, very, very right. Seasons are changing and climate's going to change. And I don't know if I can still um, share my slide, but um, just to, to give you a bit of an idea of what we want to do with the likes of Grass Check going forward and what effectively is our challenge as researchers. And um, what we want to do is use our grass growth models to say actually how are our seasons going to change um, under our UK climate projections for, for warming? Because we know that we are going to see increases in temperature. Um, and reductions in, in rainfall rates um, and uh, effectively more flashy rainfall as well coming through. And we've done a little bit of modelling um, with our site here in Northern Ireland to look at grass growth and the yellow bars there, and apologies of scientists love a graph, but are the 2010 to 2019 grass growth rates over the month. And then, uh, then the black bars are 2020 to 2029 and the grey bars are 2030 to 2039. And from the projections and the forecasts of the climate that the Met Office has put out, we can fit those into our grass growth models. And what we're really starting to see is that we will see a bit more growth during the winter months, um, but primarily driven through by better growth in October and November. So we're expecting growth September, October and into November to be up about 61%. Now, there is a lot of variability around those projections because um, I suppose a grass growth forecast is as good as our weather forecast. And, and, and so take with that what you will. You might need to take a little bit of a pinch of salt. But there is opportunities there for us to be seeing growth at different times of the season, particularly during the winter months. Um, so we'd like to start um, monitoring um, that more. But I suppose that just sort of highlights where we want to go with the likes of Grass Check B GB to be able to give a better forecast uh, short term on what grass growth will be over the next couple of weeks. And as Alwyn said, that can really help um, sort of drive and highlight, um, you know, um, take action quickly if we are coming into a drought, but also then to have a look longer term and see when do we have capacity for grass production and is that going to change um, over the years, um, you know, as, as our climate changes as well. So, okay. Yeah, yeah no, that's great. Thank you. Um, so you mentioned about um, kind of high rainfall. Another question was that how, how can farmers um, help their grasslands cope with extreme drought or extreme rainfall? What can they do to help cope with that? That's me again. Yeah, maybe, yeah, Debbie answer first and then I'll come back to Alwyn. Um, I think, I, so I think, um, and, and Alwyn did touch on that earlier on, building and making sure with her healthy soils is our starting point. Because if we have healthy soils and if we have healthy swords, yeah. we're in a much better scenario to be able to deal with those um, uh, changes and that increased volatility that we're likely to see. So, for example, if we have compacted soil, um, we know that it stays colder throughout the year. We know that our grass production will be down. We know that it's less able to utilize the nitrogen that we apply to it. Um, and we don't, we have a different um, microbial population there in the soil as well, all of which is less capable of being able to deal with extremes in temperatures and rainfall that come through. So I think I, my, my starting point would be the soil. And then after that, actually, when we do are in a drought scenario, have we got a sward there that's capable of handling it? Um, and if we've got a good soil structure there, we'll have better roots in our soil. So that'll be um, helping out our sward as well. But also then I think there are opportunities going forward and, and Alan's already touched on it again. Um, do some of the herbal lays have a role to play if we are in a drought scenario? Um, or, or are we looking at some of the festuloliums that could potentially help improve and, and add a bit of drought um, tolerance into the scenario as well? Um, so, yeah, opportunities there, I think, um, just to, to, to look at um, uh, sort of things that can help improve our, our soils to be a bit more resilient in our sports as well. Could I just go in there? I think. Our aeration program for five years in Bengashi showed the value of, of aeration. The compaction with sheep and cattle is about four inches deep. So we've been aerating and we found out the water filtration is a, definitely a marked improvement. In other words, water goes through the ground, doesn't stay on the surface. So aeration 
so we, it was a soil splitter, it works very, very well. And uh, I think we do find a difference there, especially in the winter times. That's great, thank you both. Um, another question has come through. Um, does Grass Check have a programme for farmers to profit from, these, from the study? And it would be interesting to know how much to supplement animals during the year. Um, I suppose in terms of sort of making the most of the grass check data, I, I mean, we try and publish the data as widely as possible. So do look at it on a weekly basis in terms of helping you manage grass growth in your farm and sort of it'll give indications of whether we're likely to see um, upcoming sort of droughts or, or um, uh, difficult conditions. And um, I think um, one of the things that we've started doing here in Northern Ireland and would like to do next year with GB is, is uh, publishing our maintenance plus figures for um, both milk reduction and then um, live weight gain um, off grass. So we effectively by uh, taking the value of, of the grass results that are coming through in terms of ME and looking at, uh, at what would be intake values from our research trials here each week, we can we can publish sort of typical maintenance plus figures for um, uh, both milk production and then live weight gain at grass um, as well. So that will give you, uh, hopefully give a bit of a steer of what's achievable um, at various points um, throughout the year. Um, so coming back to um, Alwyn, um, what um, advice would you have to someone who was running two different lambing flocks? Um. Advice. Well, you 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 got a scenario when you got ewes and lambs that's once growing, and ewes are in a dry period. In other words, they're not producing. And the difficulty I find is, if you hold those ewes down, you're doing more damage to the grass. Um, so, without knowing how much grass I got. I cannot delegate which cells goes to which which group of animals I'm working with. And the other thing too is I find that you soon identify which cabbages or which cells are working are producing more, and which cells need re uh, reseeding. So you've got a lot of things up in there at the same time, but without having that information in front of me every week, knowing how much grass I got about, I just don't know. Where, where where to move them uh, next week or the week after. That's great. Thank you, Alwyn. Um, so um, in terms of, Alwyn, you touched upon it, in terms of um, rotational grazing improving quality. Um, how do you believe that rotational grazing improves the quality of your grass? Why does it improve the quality? Well, <clears throat> if you think about it, when you cut a silage field, and a week, a week, 10 days later, you've got the aftermath. Well, by putting that in number of sheep grazing for one day or two days, you've got an even cut across the field. And as I said before, even the poor grasses, which we think are poor because they've gone tough, are still young and the sheep will eat them. So in other words, you have like a, an aftermath effect every time you move the sheep. That, that's the way to, I can put it, by that evenness of gracing, you know, and even as the master. Um, thank you, Alwyn. Um, so, a couple of final questions. Um, Alwyn, you've already given some kind of practical advice on preparing for 2021. Debbie, was there any specific advice you'd put out to farmers um, about preparing for next year, especially after the drought we saw this spring? Yeah, so I think I think this year and and <laughs> even running back to 2018, um, we've seen some very volatile conditions in terms of, of grass growth. Um, some swords have recovered better from it. In 2018, we had quite a short drought in comparison to this year. This year, it, it was much longer, and so it did take a harder, um, it was harder on our grass swords. I think now is the perfect time of the year um, to actually go out and walk grass swords to see what sort of condition they're in. Have we got the the you know the desired amount of someone's species in the sward? Um, and I really look um, quite closely at the quality of the pastures that we have there. So I'd be looking at that because some of the swards, as I say, won't have recovered as well from the drought um, as as others. And I think it's important to pick that up. 
so we can hear more appeals for um, reseeding. Um, uh, the other thing that I would bear, uh, just bear in mind, and again, uh, Alan's already highlighted it, but soil is becoming increasingly more important. So um, I'm always a fan of getting out and digging a hole and having a look at soil structure. Now is a good time of the year to look and see look, what has the damage from the season been, because we have seen some incredibly wet conditions um, during the early start of the year. And ground the last couple of weeks, uh, certainly if you're in Northern Ireland, you're more likely to sink um, than you are to stay afloat. Um, and and that's been, it's been challenging and there has been some damage done, particularly in wetter areas. So um, get out, have a look at what the damage has been. Reassess that in February because sometimes soils will recover themselves, but dig a hole, look for compaction and make sure um, those, those soils are in good condition um, ahead of next year. Um, perfect opportunity to take stock and see where I need to prioritise my effort in the spring in terms of getting fields in good nick to be able to carry stock and grow grass. That's some great advice. Yeah, thank you very much, Debbie. Um, so we'll just take a final question uh, for you, Alwyn. Um, have you found any challenges with growing fodder beet? Well, we didn't show the picture, but this year, Normally we sow fodder beets in first week, second week in April, depending on the season. This year we didn't sow it till the, 12th, the first week in June. And I, we can get around to the photo, but it's a slide there showing the, the growth in August and the fodder beets on the 1st of October. And you wouldn't know on the 1st of October we had a drought. So what I'm thinking is nature compensates for what we lost in the spring that's put back in the August, September. So if you look at the crop today, you never thought it was sown in the of June. I could have sown it before, but it has struggled and died and withered. But um, holding back was a decision I purposely made. I had to sell them, I had to sow them because I already bought the seed. But the gamble came off because we had the rain. As soon as we put the, so the seeds in, it rained and I don't think it stopped rain for six weeks. And we had a good kickstart and a tremendous growth there. And it's a valuable crop. It takes the pressure off, off the other grass fields in the winter. And it's a good way of going into reseeding with all that muck that's been the sheep put in. And it's a, it's a good way of reseeding. And what we're doing now is identifying which paddocks are the worst ones and focusing on those rather than just go just plowing for uh, we don't plow for the sake of um sowing we sowing reseeding fields i mean cut paddocks step so we select the paddocks and then we seed them and what would you be planting for to be done alwyn sorry what kind of soil type would you be planting the fodder beet on then we're a sandy loam type of, of soil quite light um it's, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's, it's a good way to grow in fodder beets. I don't think fodder beets likes the heavy ground, but um, the lighter ground uh, has a bit more drainage about it. But like you say, you've got to have everything right. You've got to have the fertilizer right, the lime right, and um, the timing right, and the controlling the, the weed population. And if you do that, you can have an exceptionally good crop. And you look at it, and it turns a hectare, compare that to how much grass we grow. So it's a lot of feed in a small area at the time of the year you want it most, with protein and then meat. Um, so another, another question has come in, um, asking you, Alwyn, what seed mixture you've been using for your herbal lay? <coughs> I'm asking. It's the first, I'll name the company because I don't know what we call it. First options, Herbal Lay. That's, that's the variety we've been using. And I think it's got, I always think it's not the amount of feed you put in, it's the, it's the quality of grass you put in. In other words, can you convert that at five to one or do you convert the grass at three to one? So three to one is a better value, although it might not have a, a the same quantity but it's more efficient you know it's in other words you could think about it like an ebv for grass in a way you know i've got good grass that converts better than others that 
that's that's something for the future. Yeah, now Joe Halwin. Um, so uh, that's all answered. Um, I'd just like to lastly thank Debbie and Alwyn, um, both of you, for your title and presentations tonight. Um, if um, anyone wanted to catch up on the um, presentation, it's been recorded and will be available on the HCC website and YouTube from tomorrow onwards. Um, so, yeah, thank you very much both. And, uh, not so far. Thanks, Thanks.